This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Next up, UC San Diego algae expert Stephen Mayfield and the promise of algal biofuels. We're here with Stephen Mayfield, our newest professor of biology here at UCSD. Now Steve is the director of SDCAB, which stands for the San Diego Center for Algae Biotechnology, and he's also an algae expert. In fact, he's been called an algae guru by one of the local papers in town, having spent the last 22 years at the Scripps Research Institute studying algae. Steve, welcome. Thanks, Kim. Thanks for having me out. Now, Steve, what is the interest in algae? It's the stuff that uh, we usually want to get rid of our, our, in our swimming pools. Yeah, that's right. Mo mo yeah, mo most people spend most of their energy trying to get this out of their swimming pools and bird baths. Um, the, the interest in it, I think, comes from a couple of different things. One, um, there's, there's certainly been a big push over the last few years to go to green technologies, and algae is the original green technology. Uh, and by green technologies, what we mean is renewable, sustainable, environmentally friendly. And uh, what we're learning to do uh, you know, here at UC San Diego is to train these guys to do a few things they haven't done before. One will be to make biofuels, and there's certainly a huge interest now uh, because of in bioenergy and, and in getting sustainable energy for this country. So we already have some sort of biofuel that we're pumping into gas right now, ethanol from corn. That's right. How do you compare the two? Is algae biofuels going to be something that's going to be better, cheaper than, than ethanol? Well, so, so it'll be different in, in a couple of really important ways. The, the first way is that the fuel that we get from algae is what we call fungible fuel. That means it's a direct replacement for the petroleum we use now. So the fuels we'll derive from algae will be diesel, will be gasoline, and will be jet fuel. So ethanol is not any of those. Um, ethanol, it's, it's alcohol, it's ethyl alcohol. Um, and that we can add to fuels, and we do right now at about 5%. But as soon as you go above 5%, they have a, an unwanted characteristic in that they bring water along with them. And when they do that, that completely changes um, the way your engine runs. It, it, it causes them to rust. Um, the other thing is that they're lower energy density. So ethanol only has about 70% of the energy on a per gallon basis. Um, so the fuels we make from algae will be exact replacements of what we're already making right now. So I understand al um, algae biofuels also have some other advantages over ethanol. Um, the fact that you can actually grow them um, with much, much, much greater density, for example, and uh, they don't um, emit as much carbon into the atmosphere. Is, is That's that right. Correct? So, so, so one of the things when, when, uh, when we started to make um, biofuel from, from corn, uh, from ethanol, right? Originally, people always assumed, well, since that carbon is captured by photosynthesis, that must mean that these are carbon neutral fuels, meaning the amount of carbon that you release when you burn it is exactly equivalent to the amount of carbon that was taken out of the atmosphere when you grew the fuel. And that's true, but you have to do something which we call a life cycle analysis, and that's you have to measure all the energy in. So when we're talking about corn ethanol, it's not just the energy to grow the corn, it's also the energy to take that corn, to transport it to a distillery, the energy it takes to, to ferment the corn into ethanol, and then to distill the ethanol off the water, that actually uses a huge amount of energy. So when you add all those things together, right, that's where you come up with what we call the life cycle analysis or the true carbon footprint. So in ethanol from corn, that turned out not to be very good. In fact, it turned out to, make, to, to require almost as much energy to produce the ethanol from corn that you actually got out of burning the ethanol. So it was almost the same as just using petroleum. In algae, our initial life cycle analysis say that we're about 60 to 70 percent reduction in that carbon utilization. So they look to be much better than ethanol. And it's also true that you can grow algae in a lot of different places that you can't grow higher plants. For example, you can grow it in high ceiling environments out That's in the right. desert. That's right. So, so one of the big advantages on this is that we're not going to displace existing agricultural land. So we are not going to have to go to Iowa and displace any corn or soybeans. Right? We're going we're to grow this in the deserts. We're going to grow this in wastelands. We're going to grow this out in, in the Imperial Valley near the Salton Sea where nothing chooses to grow anymore. And that's because algae has actually adapted to these very hostile environments. It spent the last couple billion years surviving in places where other organisms didn't want to, and we can take advantage of that evolution. 
and also algae uh, can make use of a lot of nutrients that actually we're using or dumping out into the uh, uh, water system um, in yeah, that, great quantities, right? Yeah, that that's right? exactly right. So, so one of the requirements for any photosynthetic organism is not only that we have sunlight and CO2, but we also need two very important nutrients. We need nitrogen and we need phosphate. And right now, all of our municipal wastewater that we dump out into the ocean or we pump back into the ground, we never pull that nitrogen and phosphate out of it. It's actually loaded with that. Now, when we take those and pump them out into the ocean, that's actually a pollutant in the ocean. So there are actually dead zones outside of every major city in the world where we are killing the ocean. And we're doing that because we're dumping water loaded with the nutrients that are required for algae. There is no reason to do that. And in the very near future, I believe all of our municipal wastewater is going to be pumped through algae ponds because that'll pull the nitrogen and the phosphate out of it, cleans the water up before we release it, and then we'll actually have the benefit of that we don't have to add artificial fertilizers to it. We're just going to take the nitrogen and phosphate that's already there. Algae actually produce gasoline or oil-like substances. Why, why is that? When any photosynthesis takes place in an organism, they're always making a decision on where they're going to divert that energy so they can put that energy into sugar, they can put that energy into hydrocarbons or lipids, or they can put that energy into proteins. So it's the hydrocarbons and the lipids that algae make, and they've just biologically decided that's what they're going to do for their storage. Mm -hmm. So that's how they store their energy. And that energy stored in hydrocarbons or in lipids can easily be converted to gasoline or diesel or jet fuel. Hmm. So what kind of algae are the best kinds to actually make algal biofuels? The stuff that you have bubbling right behind you, is that... Is, 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 is that one example? So that's one example. Yeah. So that happens to be a eukaryotic green algae. That one's called Chlamydomonas. It's sort of our favorite little lab rat. And eukaryotic means what? When we talk about algae, uh, most of us, and we look at things that grow in the water, there are actually two forms of that. One is prokaryotic, that's bacteria, and the other is eukaryotic, and eukaryotic means more sophisticated. So you and I are eukaryotes, plants are eukaryotes, dogs are eukaryotes. Bacteria are not, they're prokaryotic. So these are eukaryotic algae, the little guy grown behind me, and those naturally accumulate very high levels of fat, of lipid. So they naturally make um, lar large amounts of things that we can turn into biofuel. Um, we don't know yet which one we're going to use. So there's a couple of things that we have to identify. Uh, the best ones are going to be ones that grow fast, that produce large amounts of fat, and that are resistant to being eaten by all the little predators out there who want to come along and eat you. And so that's part of the discovery process. Now you're also working with an algae farm out in the Imperial Valley. What exactly are you doing there? And can you take us through why maybe this region might be a good place to grow algae for biofuels? Yeah, so the requirements for growing algae are obviously you'd like it to be warm. You'd like there to be lots of sunlight out there. And then it helps if you have open land that isn't very expensive. So here, actually on the coast at San Diego, we don't have very many of those good attributes. But not too far from here is the Imperial Valley, and it's really good. So the, the temperature is obviously warm out there. It's almost a desert, so there's a lot of sunlight out there. Um, there's a fair amount of water. Now, it's not high-quality potable water that we can drink. It, it's high in salt. Um, the salt and sea is there that's full of salt. But algae are perfectly capable of growing salt water, um, so it turns out to be a very good environment. Now, there's a research facility that we have out there. Uh, it's in a little city called Nyland and we have several large-scale ponds. Now the point of those ponds is not to go into production per se, but to take the, the strains that we're developing here in the lab and get them out in the real world and see how they do in what could be a commercial setting. Because once we put them out there, different things happen than happen in the lab. The sunlight's much brighter out there than it is here. There are predators that come in there and want to eat our guys. And, and so what it is is that's, that's a, a commercial type um, research facility. So what do you mean by the predators that are in the ponds right there? You know, if, if you just go and plant uh, a tomato plant out in your backyard, um, you'll know that there are insects that come and eat the tomatoes, there are fungus that attacks that, there are bacteria that get onto that, so all of those things are predators. They're all trying to eat your tomato plant, and the exact same thing happens in algae. And in fact, in algae ponds, uh, there's little, little animals called rotifers, uh, that, that fly around on little wings and gobble up everything that come through. Uh, there's another insect called the Daphnia, or some people call it water flea, and these are just fantastic little monsters. And I understand that, that you've recently discovered that there are different kinds of algae that do um, well at different times of the year out there. You've even uh, gotten a, a, a version of winter wheat, like winter algae out there. Yeah, so, so I, 
biofuels produced from algae are going to, I, I think, are going to very much look like agriculture, right? That is that we will actually have crop rotation. So one season we will have one type of algae in there, and that might be our summer algae, and then we'll have a different algae that grows there in the winter. Um, certainly temperature impacts these things, uh, sunlight impacts them, predators impact them. There's going to be times when predators are going to attack a pond and kill it, and we're just going to have to put a new different strain in, a different species in that's resistant to that predator. So there definitely will be crop rotation involved in this. Where are scientists right now in, in developing algae specifically for biofuels? So the two big challenges that we have, um, one of them of course is biologic. You know, we, we need to produce, uh, you know, these fuels at very high concentration in the algae. But the main one is economic and that is we have to learn to go to scale. Uh, we, we burn about 150 billion gallons of gasoline every year in this country. That's an enormous number. So if we're really going to make a dent in that, if we are really going to take biofuels and impact the amount of fuel that, that we use in this country, it's a very large number. So going to scale, that's something we've never done before. That's something we've never done before in biofuels. We've done it in American agriculture. We have about 100 million acres of corn. We have about 50 million acres of soybean. We think that we could replace most of the, of the liquid fuels required in this country with about 30 to 40 million acres of algae. So that's a big number, but it's a number that we, we think we can deal with. How long will it take to develop algae as biofuels, and, and how much does it cost right now, and can, can we really expect this to be in our pumps in the next 10 years or so? It depends who you, who you ask. I, I think we'll have something launched in the next two to three years. There will be pilot plants out there um, that are growing algae, that are producing fuels from them, that we're driving cars, that we're flying airplanes on. But of course, it'll be a very small scale compared to the amount of fuel we actually use in this country. Hmm. But right now, algae is, is fairly expensive if, if, if you want to put it in your tank. You can make it right now, but right. it's fairly expensive. How much per gallon? Uh, you know, right now, the estimates, the estimates range from about $10 per gallon up to about $50 or $60 per gallon. And, and that, that's, a, you know, that, that's a pretty big number. That's not something you or I would want to pay to put into our cars right now. But as a scientist, whenever I look at a problem and I say, oh, I only have to make a tenfold improvement in it, that's pretty easy to do biologically. So if we're at something like 10 or $20 per gallon now and we can make a five-fold improvement in that, then we're competitive with, with petroleum, with fossil fuel. And we think we can achieve that in the next three to five years. So now corn ethanol had a lot of promises when it came out, and uh, now we're starting to discover that it has some problems. Right. Um, are we painting too rosy a picture of algal biofuels or are we getting ahead of ourselves? There's a cautionary tale that, w that we got from ethanol. You know, it looked really good coming out the door. It's like, wow, this will create jobs for farmers. We can blend this in our gasoline, right? And it's only when the industry became a little more mature that we began to look at these things. Um, so, you know, we, we want to be careful as we develop these things in algae. Now, certainly, if we, if we just sit down and, and you know, take a, take a pencil and paper and draw out you know, the, the energy inputs and the energy outputs, algae looks much, much better than corn. Um, everything we know about it so far says that it's going to be much better than corn from, from a greenhouse gas perspective. Um, however, I do, you know, like you, I, you know, I read the paper and I watch the news and I see some outrageous claims from algae, things that certainly are not true. But I think the industry's been around long enough um, that some very sober minds have taken a look at this. We've had a couple of years to start to measure real numbers, um, you know, there are, there are a number of companies out there now, Sapphire Energy, which I'm a founder of, um, they, they now have several hundred acres down in New Mexico, 40 acres under production, uh, General Atomics, uh, Solazyme. There are a number of companies, commercial companies out there that have been out long enough and started to produce real data and it's still looking pretty good. We have to get the cost down. We have to learn to go to very large scale. Um, but if we do those two things, I'd say it's looking very good for us. So algae is really the, the, the growth plan of the future. Yeah, you know, what I tell people is I think that it's going to be the new agriculture. Um, you know, we have a very good history in this country of agriculture, of the developments we put into it, of the, of the efficiencies we brought to it. And, uh, you know, we produce enough food here to feed ourselves, and we export a huge amount to the rest of the world. You know, th thank God we do, because that, that, that keeps large parts of, of the third world alive, you know, when they're having famines and the likes. And I think algae has an opportunity to come right along with that. It can be the new corn and the new soybean. Wow. So pond scum can actually save the world then? Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> on, on its own, I don't know if it's going to save the world. But I think it can change the world in a positive way. 
I think it's an opportunity that we have ignored. Uh, you know, listen, we, we, we've been eating algae for thousands of years, right? We, we've known it's been out there and we've ignored it. Part of the reasons we ignored it is because there wasn't a requirement before for it. Uh, petroleum was abundant, our food was abundant, but you know, there's more than six billion of us on this planet now. Uh, we're, we're frankly running out of resources. And so every opportunity we have that brings new resources to the table, we have to take advantage of those. And right now, this is the best new resource we have out there. Uh, we have to spend some time, we have to do some research, we have to do some development, some engineering development, some biological, some regulatory development, right? This, these are changing times and we're gonna have to digest those and it's gonna, take, it's gonna be a little bit painful sometimes, it's gonna take a little longer than we hoped but it's a brand new resource, it's a new energy resource, it's a new food resource, it's a new economic resource. And I think all of those things are, re are really driving it uh, to be the new technology and to make San Diego the Green Houston. Wow, well that's an optimistic future and I thank you for being here and, thanks for your, and, and good luck with your research here yeah. at UCSD. Thanks Kim, thanks. we all need it. Yeah. <laughs>